My guest today is Chuck Palahniuk, who is by my count the author of 25 and a half books, uh, including Fight Club, Invisible Monsters, Pygmy, Damned, and Invisible Monsters Remixed, hence the half book. Although now that I've taken a better look at it, I think it should be counted as a whole book. All right. I'm particularly enamored of uh, his three most recent books, Adjustment Day, which imagines the dissolution of America from within due to prophecies and polemics of a strange voice from the internet. Consider this a useful, companionable book containing lessons and stories about writing itself and the invention of sound, his latest novel. The invention of sound tells the story of a man whose life is defined by his despair after the abduction of his daughter, a sorrow and an anger that leads him to scary places on the dark web, and a woman who continues her father's legacy of seeking after Foley screams so sublime they will cause all humans who hear the screams to sympathetically match the scream with even more horrible <laughs> results. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for giving me some time here. Ah, not at all. Thank you. So, you know, one of the <laughs> things that uh, has struck me about your work is just how hard you work at it. And so you're, consider this, uh, I, I was really charmed by it. Uh, partly it's, it's got some tough love in there and basically a lot of it is, yeah, just if you could not write, just do that, not write. But, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, also, you know, what strikes me is, uh, and, and, you know, this is a, a notice I also had uh, when, when looking at John Waters' writing is, uh, you know, there is this urge to be transgressive and to gain attention. Um, but I think you are careful about what you're trying to be transgressive about. But also, you really put your shoulder into the writing so that the writing is great. So that, uh, you know, you don't expect, I think, people to uh, read your books if they're not great books first. Does that seem like a fair assessment that you're, you're working your butt off on these books? Uh, yeah, very much so. You know, that's, uh, that's so much the minimalism that I was taught was that it starts with a sentence. And when I worked full time at a job job, it was just my, my goal every day was if I could just get one sentence that I was happy with every day, then it felt like my life was worth living. I had done something above and beyond just paying the bills every day. A sentence that maybe felt resonant or that would stick. You know, and I think that's why so many of the sentences are uh, either A, stolen from somebody else, because so often that thing that is so brilliant and so perfectly worded is not your own. It's just the thing you overhear and that you admire. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald was famous for stealing every witty, clever, insightful thing that Zelda ever said, and he's kind of castigated for it now. But the other part is, uh, uh, I think that's why so many of my sentences have become memes and tattoos, is because they really it encapsulate just one really succinct idea, and there's a little bit of poetry to them. Uh, someone gave me a pillow that said, let me see. The things you own end up owning you. <laughs> and she knit this herself. And it's that kind of uh, sort of symmetrical poetry that makes these things very sticky in people's minds and make some really appropriate for memes and tattoos. And so even if I just get one of those every day, I'd be perfectly happy. And it probably requires uh, generating a lot of stuff to find those moments where you're like, oh, that, that. Yeah. And it, it requires uh, deleting, erasing, throwing <laughs> away a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of the glory part is that I've got friends who are painters and when they make a mistake, it's it's money down the drain. But when I make a mistake, it's just time down the drain. A lot easier on the psyche, I think, and the fingers. And the environment. <laughs> I also have to think that journalism maybe has something to do with this, at least in terms of having a respect for every word having to carry its weight. 
every word having to carry its weight, but also I think being trained at, at a school of journalism, we had a kind of an awareness of not using opinionated or pejorative language, that we couldn't use abstracts that, uh, that betrayed our own opinion or our own sort of uh, prejudice about something. And so when I went into minimalism and Tom Spanbauer taught us about recording angel, I, it was just natural in that kind of fly on the wall perspective. It was, I was trained not to use pejorative or abstract language and everyone else suffered, just struggled with that distinction forever. Uh, and now, nowadays you go to mainstream media and they don't hesitate to use loaded, abstract, <laughs> pejorative language. So in a way, I feel like my fiction is way ahead of the game that way. <laughs> well, I think because the the rules of journalism has changed and the definition of journalism has changed. And the goal of journalism, I think, has changed. Well, you know, I'm very happy to be associated with Miami Book Fair as uh, press, mm. but also I was a bit surprised that they let me in the first year. Like, I didn't have a track record, and it's like, no, I've got a website. Okay, come on down. I'm like, okay. And yeah. it's not that I don't feel like I was worthy, but I wasn't sure they should figure out yet that I was worthy. I'm going to be at the book fair this year, I guess, in a virtual way, like everybody else. Yep. Yep. So I hope you have a great fair. <laughs> Thank you. So one of the other things that uh, it just made me feel great about consider this was just how much love you have for your mentors and how much gratitude you have for your mentors. Mm. And... Uh, you know, uh, you know, I went through NYU's MFA program and I, I wouldn't have traded it, it for the world, but a lot of it is just simply, um, hints and, and <laughs> notes that we've stolen from <laughs> someone who stole it from someone or stole it for someone. And we try and, and keep track of, you know, who said it, <laughs> because when we find something that really does help, uh, it really just reduces so much of the extraneous confusion so that we can focus on the essence of the confusion and try and figure out a story to tell. And so uh, I, I was really charmed at how well you did that uh, and, and how heartfelt it seemed like all of these writers, uh, including writers who, you know, if we look at their DNA as a writer and your DNA, like it's not a straight line necessarily, which is probably, you know, one of the great things about being a writer is how many places we learn from and who helps us grow. There was a kind of sense of panic that struck me when Barry Hanna and Tom Jones and Catherine Dunn and uh, Dennis Johnson and Ursula, Ursula Le Guin uh, and Nora Ephron all died very quickly within this very short stretch of a couple of years. And uh, it, it, it panicked me thinking, you know, uh, so many of the people that I really admired are gone. And I really want to put these notes down on paper uh, and in a way record everyone's best advice and everyone's wonderful anecdote and their really useful trick. Uh, because, you know, if somebody didn't stop and do it, it didn't seem like it was getting done. Well, it was uh, just a... Uh, the perfect, you know, uh, I, I read a lot of those kind of books, you know, uh, for this podcast and a uh, co-host of, uh, of mine, Vanessa Blakesley, we discussed You're a Stranger Than Fiction, uh, even though it's not directly a writing book, but we didn't have a writing book by you at the time. So we, we decided to cover it and it was a great episode. But uh, yeah, a lot of these books are kind of interchangeable and I kind of don't mind as long as I pick out one or two things, even if I already know them, like, okay, to remember them in a vivid way, like that's good enough. But uh, consider this uh, kick, you know, like it really dusted my whole brain off, which I really, really needed. <laughs> so uh, it, it's like near the, at the top of my list of, okay, if you're going to have to get one of those books, like you're not going to go to an MFA or not this year and you kind of want to, you know, get in there, like consider this as, as one of the best. Now, uh, the first workshop I was ever in, the, the, the book that we were all told to get and to read was uh, John Gardner's, uh, mm -hmm. is it On Writing? Uh, I, no, no, that's Stephen King's book. 
Uh, it's called writing fiction or uh, the craft the, of fiction. I want to say the craft of fiction. Yes, and the Gardner book was filled with such really highbrow references, mm-hmm. <laughs> and we never discussed it in the workshop, and no one ever referred to it. And I wondered why we had all been asked to read it because it was never it was never applied or or used. And so, in a way, I really wanted to write. A, a useful book that would have a lot of lowbrow references that applied and demonstrate how each technique was being used in very popular 20th century fiction. And it's very readable in and of itself, which is also, I think, a requirement of one of those books where the John Gardner, uh, it, it's great in some ways. Um, I, I've, I just remember how absurdly critical and angry he was at metafiction Mm-hmm. And uh, like I, I can appreciate probably his exasperation in that particular moment in literary history, <laughs> but considering like the avalanche of uh, what has happened with postmodernism since, like I, <laughs> it, it it comes off as really quaint. I think. Now, was he writing that as a contemporary of Gaddis and Pynchon? Is that what he was reacting to? Yeah, I think to? it was the early to mid seventies. I think is when the craft of fiction comes out, and it's, you know, uh, of course, to upstart young writers. Uh, oh, this is going to shake up the establishment. Like, of course, I'm going to mimic that. And so, I imagine in the in the nineties, so many writing teachers had to deal with everyone who thought they were going to be Dave Foster Wallace or you that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they maybe had their hands full uh, <laughs> with that. And so, uh, and then the moment passes and then it's like, oh yeah, right. David Foster Wallace, there's plenty to learn from, but yeah, uh, it's it's important not to make it a religion, I think, as a writer, because um, you need to build your own. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, it's always sad to mention David yeah. Uh, a million years ago, when Fight Club first came out in Italian, there was this very famous, uh, uh, she was a translator and critic named Fernando Paivano. And she was uh, the woman who had brought and translated Hemingway and Steinbeck and Faulkner, you know, all these American writers and introduced them to Italian culture. And she really was the leading Italian literary authority. And she did this fantastic piece about Fight Club in which she said the future of American literature is going to be uh, David Foster Wallace and Chuck Palahniuk. And I was always just really stunned by that. And then when David died, I saw that he and I had been born on exactly the same day, uh, February 21st, 1962. And uh, I was really stunned by that. And, you know, I'm always gonna miss the fact that, that David is not here doing this job yeah. Well, his uh, posthumous novel, like, it's on my shelf, and I can't bring myself to read it, because I need to believe there's at least one more out there. <laughs> and so I don't know when the right time is going to be to read it, but so far I haven't found the right time. So, lighten things up now. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I really loved about the invention of sound is there is both this uh, nostalgia and cynicism about old time Hollywood and an interest in how uh, movies get made. And so you really made Foley work, which is a difficult thing. You know, you can't make noises technically. You, you can try and make the reader make noises, but you can't make noises in a novel. And so you have to convey uh you know, the science of sound, but also, you know, the, um, how sound works on the body in in fiction. And I thought that you did that really well. So was that something you were confident about early on? Or did that take a while to figure out like, okay, no, I, I can make a book out of this concept and be able to deliver it? Well, so much of that is, if you can't use pejorative fiction and you can't dictate the physical emotional reaction. You can't tell the reader, oh, this is a scary part or suddenly a terrifying (laughs) noise broke out. Suddenly uh, uh, all the horror was apparent and that 
terrific over the top Lovecraft way. Uh, you can't do that in minimalism. You can't dictate emotional state or emotional reaction. So you look at the things you can do. And one is to go on the body to describe the physical reaction, either of the point of view character or of someone else who's present, describe just what their body does and how that communicates the emotional state without having to say it outright. So the uh, that's half of the book. And the other book is uh, where there's kind of two to three main characters, depending on how we regard it. And also, uh, it kind of works like a play in that, you know, all these Chekhovian pieces, like, we don't know how they all fit, but they're all going to fit before the end. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Gates Foster and, you know, that story and, you know, what maybe inspired you to uh, think about some of the really dark evil that's, that's out there. You know, uh, there's a kind of tried and true uh, technique, and that is a dead child automatically signals drama. Uh, if there's a dead child or a missing child, this is going to be something very dramatic and is never going to have the kind of broad lightness of comedy. But if there's a dead parent, then it signals it's going to be comedy. And if you look at, you know, most of the, the most of the television in my lifetime, it centers around a dead parent that is missing, and that can't be resolved. And the children don't really react to it. You know, the Partridge family, they never sat around and said, oh, do you miss dad? Dad's dead. You know, and uh, one day at a time, they never sat around and said, do you miss dad? Dad's dead and Alice doesn't live here anymore. They never really sit around and say, do you miss dad? No, dad was a <laughs> son of a bitch. Comedy is always about a dead parent and seeing children, primarily children move forward, but children and women. A lot of times children and men, courtship of, courtship of Eddie's father, uh, family affair with uh, Sebastian Cabot. Uh, it's children and men. But you always see these vulnerable characters moving forward very boldly, despite this huge, tragic, unresolvable thing in the background. So with Gates Foster, he hasn't seen his daughter in 17 years. She disappeared when she was eight. And the only time he sees her is when he opens the dairy case at the supermarket and he sees the age progressed uh, depiction of her on the side of a milk carton or something. And so he has started this, this campaign to explore the dark web because he might not be able to find her. But if he can find a man in any kind of a, a photograph or video with her, then he might be able to find the man who destroyed her or abducted her. Um, and so his, his mission, you know, joining at Media Ray, is to find any kind of trace of who did whatever happened to his daughter. And so, of course, it's drama. There was a, uh, an analogy that really broke my friend Amy Hempel. She does enormous amounts of fantastic animal rescue work. And her heart was broken when she read my analogy that when they look for animals to use in product testing or uh, scientific experiments, a lot of times, well, they'll, they'll look for former house pets because former house pets were raised with love and they will always try to please whoever has custody of them. And they will tolerate an enormous amount of pain and suffering without lashing out where strays picked up on the street have a survival instinct. And if you try to product test or do some sort of medical experiment on them, they will try to destroy you. And so Gates Foster is hoping that since his daughter was raised with so much love that she might have been able to tolerate an enormous amount of torture and suffering and that she might in some way still be alive because she had that, that uh, tolerance 
that a dog or a cat, you know, had being raised by people who loved it. Because you won't that, that let made, go. <laughs> that made Amy cry like crazy. She, <laughs> oh, that killed her. Well, and, you know, part of the premise uh, on the other side is also the way dogs respond to sirens and this this sort of need to sympathetically join the noise around you, which, you know, in a vague sense is definitely a metaphor for America right now. Uh, but in a specific sense, you know, leads down uh, the science of, of hearing. And so there's two examples of your understanding of dogs enhancing your ability to imagine, uh, you know, the human condition in, you know, a little more nuanced way. Um, I, I think we uh, underrate <laughs> Uh, how we are in the continuum of the animal world rather than being completely above it or separate from it. And for so much of my life, my life, there were periodically these uh, anthropomorphized animal novels that were huge successes. There was uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. There was uh, Watership Down, uh, Secrets of the Rats of Nim. Um, there were, you know, book after book that people bought by the millions in which animals basically acted as people and were very relatable because of that. I think that there's a dynamic functioning there where if you can make the reader feel more or less superior to the characters, then the reader will have a great deal more empathy and sympathy and nurturance for the character. And my favorite example is uh, the, the first page of Gone with the Wind what is the first thing that Scarlett O'Hara says? Uh, I know it's in the, uh, consider this, but I don't remember. It is, she says, uh, war, war, war. There is not going to be any war. <laughs> and as soon as she says that, we think you poor, dumb girl. And despite her social privilege and her charm and, and all of these advantages, we feel superior to her and we instantly care for her because we know that she's heading for a disaster. And I think that there's a subtle similar thing happening with animal narratives because as human beings, we feel superior to rabbits or seagulls. And so we, we let our guard down and we're more emotionally involved with them than we would be with another human being. In Cujo, Stephen King has like a three page bit where it's Cujo's point of view. It's a close third on the dog. And I don't remember most of the book and the horrible part. I don't remember, but I cannot forget the bit where he went into the mind of the dog. And I'm like, I'm the dog reading it. I am the dog. And it didn't feel as strange as it maybe should have. That's when the dog gets bit by the bat, right? I think so. Yeah. Like, I think it's kind of going about its dog day. And then at the end of that, I think that's when, yeah, the rabies mm -hmm. uh, incident happens.